Awesome. And we're recording. Yay. Awesome. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Zoe and Kylie edition of Rapid Fire Friday. It's going to be a whole melange of topics. Um, and we can just dive right in. And as always, like, feel free to jump in if you have thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, haikus to share with the group. Um, you know, like one of the reasons that we make these Zooms and not just like one directional, uh, like I guess, sermons about the importance of mental health and food, uh, which they very well could be, um, is because we want you guys to participate and we care about what you think and feel about these topics as well. And I think a lot of people might struggle to claim themselves as experts in this field, but you guys are experts. So, you know, always feel free to uh, give feedback and just be a part of whatever discussion we're mm -hmm. having. So question number one, um, should I always run with music or a podcast? I'm a music person, but I don't wanna run with it all the time because I don't want to be totally reliant on music for my mojo. I love that question because I feel like it answers itself uh, with the hazards of being overly reliant on music for being the sole source of your mojo. Um, obviously it's something that can be hugely motivating and help a lot, but you know, I mean, if you feel that you can only perform well when you have access to music, that obviously can be hugely limiting when it comes to things like, you know, races, uh, you know, workouts, like, or days where just like you forget your phone, like Spotify doesn't work. Like all of these things ha have happened to all of us at some point. So you never want to be fully reliant on music as your only source of like motivation or, um, you know, ability to perform. Um, another caveat to that is you don't want to, sometimes people will run a little too hard on accident when they're listening to music and you want to just like make sure that music isn't accidentally preventing you from uh, accessing whatever effort level you intend to train at. For instance, like if you're listening to Cardi B on your easy day, you might find yourself rapidly accelerating right out of uh, zone one, right on into zone Cardi, um, cardio freak seven days a week. Um, and that's, that's not good either. So just be cognizant. Um, don't become over-reliant on music. I am personally a huge fan of podcasts and audiobooks because I feel like they provide like enough distraction that, you know, when I'm doing a long run, I don't get bored, but also I don't usually get like too jazzed listening to Brene Brown that I accidentally start tempoing because I'm feeling so caught up in my own vulnerability or whatever. So, uh, yeah, would love to know how many people here are like very, also there's, I would say there's concerns like if you're on the trail, you want to just be aware of your surroundings. There's obviously like safety things uh, when it comes to listening to music while trail running. I personally love it. Uh, I almost never race without music, but I usually don't start the race with music either because I have like a little MP3 player that has a f only four hours of battery life. So I usually am like, okay, when it gets hard, that's when you break out the cardio freak playlist. Uh, but until then you're on your own, just you and your brain. Would love to know if anyone here is adamantly pro or anti-music. Team silence. Tell I'll, you. I'll speak up. Uh, <laughs> I am pro music. I'm pro music or podcast. I use the Aftershocks headphones so they don't go in my ears. And I find those work fantastic. Hmm, those are really great. Particularly if, like if you're running on trail or in like any kind of situation where you might encounter traffic, those are excellent. Mm -hmm. For people that don't know, they're like bone conducting headphones. Um, so yeah. like you can still hear, like it's like, it's actually very cool. You can be listening to Cardi B while yeah, also right having here. a lovely conversation with your running partner. <clears throat> yeah, Virginia's got a pair on right now. Yeah, oh my gosh, nice. Yeah, I've got the, I've got the community, I've got two pair. I've got one pair, like Krista said, that I use to run with. And then this is the communication. It's got a mic boom that I use for uh, work. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, they're super awesome. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah, we've got podcasts, iPod Touch, podcasts. Yep, yep. Love it. Awesome. Sweet. Well, question number two, this one is for Kylie. And I think it's great, um, particularly given the seasonality of it. Uh, Kylie, do our hydration and fueling needs change during the winter? I'm never thirsty on my runs. I set my watch to remind myself to eat, but otherwise would probably not be hungry. Are fueling needs the same? And are there any strategies for those of us who struggle to remember to fuel? 
Yay. <laughs> um, feeling. So, so I'm going to chat a little bit and then I'd love to hear what other people, if anyone else has any other suggestions, that would be great because, um, with athletes that I work with, um, number one with timing of things, there's not, in my opinion, there's not a lot of options for reminding yourself except for a beeper on the watch or writing something on your hand as a reminder to get yourself in the pattern of fueling regularly. Um, in regards to whether you still need to be taking in the same number of um, calories and that sort of nutrition, yes, you're still gonna have the same um, caloric needs, uh, same goals of, you know, typically, I usually say 170 to 300 calories per hour, um, depending because females can get away with a little bit less, um, depending on body size. Um, so you're still going to have that goal. Um, so there's not a lot of strategy for that. And I would say, um, choosing things that don't freeze is always a good idea too. If you're in a really cold climate, so I like things. to store my snacks in my sports bra during the winter. Yeah. So that's so a good, that's different. a good tip. <laughs> and then, um, sometimes like depending on, uh, how long the run is and what your pace is, it, you know, in regards to freezing of things, you can, um, take things like, like pumpkin bread or a muffin or cookie or something. If, you know, if it's really cold and you're doing a really long run, that can always be a good option because it won't freeze. But then I also like your idea of keeping like your gel or um, your, you know, spring energy or something next to your skin with the sports Gotta bra. Gotta have it at 98.6, baby. So, sorry, guys, you don't have a sports bra, so <laughs> you could wear one, but. Uh, <laughs> My snack bra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exactly. just full of snacks. <laughs> Sir, is that a sports bra full of pumpkin bread? <laughs> um so, so in regards to the actual like calories, um, again, those are going to remain the same. And I think you're, you'll have to experiment and um, try to remind yourself that you still need to be taking in um, that kind of fuel. Um, in regards to hydration, I think this is where it can get a little bit more tricky for people. Number one, the blood is usually diverted away from the GI system a little bit more when it is cold to warm the extremities. Um, so it, it does actually blunt the thirst response. So your body, you're, that's kind of working against you in a way. So you can't really rely on thirst when it's cold outside with hydration. Um, I usually say that, uh, you know, the, the general recommendation is 16 to 20 ounces of fluids per hour. But I think you can, it, again, it's going to depend on your sweat rate. And I think you can drop that down a little bit uh, lower. In particular, I, I remember working with Mike in the group and um, he was like, it's, I, I cannot take in this much per hour when it's this cold out. And, um, and so we dropped it down a little bit because he was like having to stop to pee all the time. And I'm like, all right, let's drop the rate down a little bit. And I think that's where like experimentation a little bit on um, what works for you uh, is good, but I still would say you need to, you still need to be hydrating regularly. It's not a matter of like, oh, it's cold out, so I don't need any fluids at all. Um, you still are sweating, um, even if you don't realize you are. I mean, you can usually tell that you are after a run when you sit around and you're like freezing cold, you know, that sweat is like drying on the skin um, and you still are losing electrolytes too. So, you know, considering that you would still um, really want to be using your hydration mix as well um, that you're going to maybe be practicing with for your races. Um, I would say electrolyte needs probably wouldn't be quite as high uh, in the cold. Um, so again, like when you're looking at a range of three to 500 milligrams of sodium per hour, you know, you can start on the lower end for, um, for hydrating with the, the electrolytes. Any tips on hydrating throughout the day in the winter? I know like for myself in summer, it's a lot easier to be cognizant of that. Um, you know, I think in winter, it's just like hydration is one of those things that it doesn't bite us in the butt so much. And so maybe we start to, you know, kind of back burner that I would love to know what tips you have or like how you do that in, in your life. 
I know that you like me are on team excessive coffee uh, sometimes. So especially during the winter, it's nice to drink something warm. How do you how do you hydrate just like on the daily? For me personally, is that where? Sure. Yeah. Or like, how do you recommend other people? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good um, a good. You're, so you're talking daily hydration then? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think that it's important to remember that uh, water isn't the only fluid that you can count towards your daily fluid intake goals. Um, and I think that's a common misconception. So um, coffee does actually count up until a certain point, you know, <laughs> drinking an entire pot of coffee probably is going to put you over that threshold, um, which is usually around like three to 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. Um, a standard like eight ounce cup of coffee is going to have like between 80 and 90 milligrams of caffeine. So depending on how many cups is in the, the pot of coffee you're having, you might be having a little too much. And that threshold is, is where the caffeine starts to have that dehydrating effect. You're going to start peeing a lot more. Um, and so, so you can count coffee a little bit. Herbal teas are always a good option because, you know, if it's cold out, it's nice to have something a little bit warm. Um, soup and broth is that can count uh, towards hydration goals. Um, a tip that I usually give to people that I'm working with are to try and um, pair your activity together. So um, pair your uh, hydration with a meal potentially. So um, you have your breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then you would have um, like a glass of water or a, a you know, sparkling water or something with your meal. So that's another tip is like, if you forget to drink throughout the day, trying to pair, pair the meal with the hydration can be helpful. Obviously keeping the water bottles around is one tip that people give a lot. Um, uh, using like a tracking, like a water tracking app, just to keep yourself like accountable can be helpful. I think I talked about this before. There's like an app called water aquarium, where if you don't drink enough water, you can, you kill your fish. So it's oh, no. very motivating. Oh yes. Yeah. So you got to keep the fish alive. <laughs> I love that. It's like hydration, human Tamagotchi. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Great. I love that. Um, yeah, I think the key takeaways are that you still have to focus, like your fuel needs do not change, uh, but your fuel sources potentially can. And uh, your hydration needs change slightly, but probably a lot of us are potentially erring on the side of dehydration in winter where we could all benefit from a little extra help from herbal tea and or soup and or coffee. And Kylie gives us permission to drink moderate amounts of coffee, which is really all I've wanted to hear ever. <laughs> Awesome. Well, for a total tonal shift, question number three, how can we promote diversity and inclusion in running during the pandemic? Is there anything we can do other than share articles and promote these ideas on Facebook or Instagram? I really love this question um, because I mean, a large portion of my work outside of microcosm um, at Trail Runner is in working with, you know, both Trail Runner and also like other organizations within my company to um, promote a more diverse and also just like a, a, a better future of what running, particularly trail running can and should look like. Um, and something, I just wanna be clear that like all of the learning I've done on this is not because I'm like a brilliant or smart person. All of this learning has come from people of color who've been generous enough to share their experience and knowledge with me. So like, you know, just want to disclose that this is not like special Zoe knowledge. This is 100% uh, because I've benefited from the knowledge and experience of other people who have been vulnerable with me and shared. And I would love to know, like, as we discuss this, cause I know it's a vulnerable topic. And if you're like me, you're like, oh God, I'm on yet another Zoom with a bunch of white people talking about diversity and running oh God, I'm sweating so much and I haven't even had that much coffee. Um, but I think it's really important for us to use these white spaces, primarily white spaces, to have these conversations, um, to imagine like what microcosm coaching or what trail running or endurance running or walking or like whatever it is can and should look like um, if we all work together and try to, you know, just like reimagine what it can be. Um, you know, my dream is that microcosm coaching could and should look radically different um, in a good way. Uh, so something that I've done a lot of learning on and has been like a helpful heuristic for me is that, and this is like full disclosure, I am from the South. I did not have like 
just to be like super vulnerable, did not have a very nuanced education around like race relations or even like US history to be perfectly uh, frank. Uh, I found out about the Tulsa massacre last year uh, from watching Watchmen on HBO, which is an excellent show that everyone should watch. Um, but like, I think, you know, that's just to say that like we all come from different backgrounds on these things and it's okay um, that we're coming from different places. And the important thing is having tough discussions and challenging ourselves and others and holding each other accountable within a community to do and be better. Um, and I think something that like, you know, that just to speak to the like the part of this question that's about like, you know, harnessing the power of social media while like as a millennial, I think social media is excellent. I do think that it has weaknesses as an outlet for activism as that it primarily prioritizes like outward appearing things rather than like, I mean, you would look like an asshole if you went on Facebook and posted like, I'm doing the internal work to be less racist, you know, like no one's going to like that, but it's like the important work that we all must do. So I think like a really important thing is to check yourself and make sure you're not centering your own narrative, your own needs, you, like your own desire to appear woke or empathetic or like whatever buzzword you want to use on social media and just make sure that these things are coming from a good and authentic place um which often means admitting that like you don't we don't you know as white people we have a lot of learning to do all of us um and that you know it's going to be uncomfortable and that we should lean into that discomfort because that's where the good stuff happens um so I something that also, i oh, oh yeah. sorry Zoe, i didn't mean to interrupt no no, you. no go for it um i think Kristen also, also does a lot of this work by the I way. do. Yeah. I just, we wrapped up the, um, I work for Zwift and we did the black celebration series in honor of black history month. Um, and we didn't want to just celebrate one month of black history. Like it's a series that goes on throughout the year, but I was fortunate enough to interview a lot of really amazing athletes like Nelson Bales and Aisha Pratt-Lear. And one thing that Aisha said during our interview, um, when I asked her what she thought the biggest challenge that most black, black athletes face is that um, like her direct quote was that she thought black athletes, um, the challenge that they face is that is being valued as much off the field of play as they are on the field of play. And, you know, when she said that it just kind of like hit a chord with me and definitely I get it. Um, and I think that it's really difficult to combat the shut up and play mentality that a lot of people hold for the black athletes. Um, so I think as white people, you know, it's like, yeah, LeBron is an amazing athlete, but he's also a human being, you know, or Aisha is an amazing middle distance runner, but she's also a human being. And I think just keeping those things in mind when we're watching sports or when we're watching, you know, these, these like performances that, it's not always just like, they're not here to impress you. They're not here to, you know, entertain you. They're doing what they're doing because they genuinely love to do it. Yeah, I think that's so, so important is not, you know, once again, like trying to appreciate all humans as humans, not just as, as explicitly performers. And I think that also speaks to a larger issue in endurance sports of trying to sideline politics where um, a lot of us just live in bodies that are inherently political. Like if you are a woman on the trails, congrats, your existence is inherently political. You know, like your safety, your ability to exist in spaces is tied to the body politic. Um, so I've just never been one to say like, oh, let's keep, politics out of sports because like that's an incredibly privileged in my opinion uh slash experience is an incredibly privileged position that just like doesn't make the world better and that's very boring to me and I'm here to make the world better and like also train a good bit along the way um and I hope that that's where a lot of us are kind of coming to and like you know like not that you need to take like a heavy burden out every time you go on a jog or whatever but like we have this amazing platform we have this amazing community and like I don't know if you're the kind of person that believes in yourself enough to run an ultra, like surely you can believe in yourself enough to like change the world a little bit <laughs> is kind of how I feel about things. Um, so I think it's just like really important to not, um, you know, like if you don't feel that these things affect you on a daily basis, maybe that can like lead you to an understanding that other people do not have that same privilege and you can use, um, you know, you can use that for better. Um, so kind of like the big, you know, I think for me, a big learning point has been like, particularly coming from the South, like the word racist is thrown along around a lot as like a moniker to like 
kind of like as this black and white thing, right? Like this is, you are racist, you are not racist. This is racist, this is not racist. And I think a lot of us have been enjoying the work of Ibram X. Kendi, um, you know, after the George Floyd protest happened in June. Um, he kind of like, he wrote a book several years ago, but it became very popular and I would highly recommend it because I feel like it shaped a lot of my learning on this very difficult topic as not understanding the world as being just racist, but being like having a more nuanced spectrum of racist versus anti-racist and anything that is racist supports a racial hierarchy. Anything that is anti-racist questions and does not promote a social hierarchy. So rather than like trying to say like, oh, you know, I'm not racist. You can say, yes, like I engage and support systems that are inherently racist or like su inadvertently support a racial hierarchy. Um, rather than it being like a name calling thing, it's a way of examining ourselves and others and the systems that we inhabit to make them more equitable rather than like, oh, I'm not a bad person, you know, like you know, it's not about that. It's about checking ourselves like on a deeper level rather than trying to like demonstrate a perceived uh, perfection or like, you know, put on a put on airs. Um, and I think that one of the fun things about this is that it's like, you know, in microcosm, we're always big proponents of things that are like not sexy on social media. And I feel like this work is exactly that, right? Like there's nothing you can do on Instagram that like adequately demonstrates the work that you're doing inside yourself. And that is absolutely where this must begin. And for me, um, a big part of it starts with accepting that we've all been raised in a society that elevates white culture over other cultures. Being anti-racist means challenging those notions first and foremost inside yourself. Um, and just like, that is the culture. Like, I know we have athletes from all over the world, but just to speak to the American culture, that is our history. Uh, and that is something that you kind of have to accept to begin to understand to begin to dismantle and I think starting with that understanding that it like doesn't make you a bad person it makes you a product of the culture we were all raised in and then once you understand that you can start to dismantle it in the more nuanced ways that it shows up like in your place of work and your personal life and running like whatever it is um, I think it's important to learn about the history of racism and anti-racism in America and to educate yourself about the complexities and the nuances of the issues that we're looking at. So once again, trying to look at this through the frame of sport or running generally, like Kristen mentioned, um, there is a profound history of lifting up Black bodies as athletes and then devaluing them as humans and citizens. And that is something that we really, really need to uh, dismantle just for like a specific example. Um, I think something that another thing that you can do within the specific realm of running, like this is once again, a lot of this is going to be colored by my biases as someone that works to dismantle these systems within media specifically. So another thing I, uh, suggest is seeking out media that is actively anti-racist and supporting a diverse array of creators that, challenge you and push you like if the only people that you follow on Instagram or like the only books you read or podcasts you listen to or magazines you read if the creators writers and like photographers people represented there look and think like you then you need to expand um your media diet uh and you need to push media outlets that aren't doing that like one of my big goals is to always be the person in the room or on the Zoom uh at Trail Runner who's like why have we not included an African American creator in this story why does our photography all white women here? Uh, this is a, you know, this is a feature about runner safety. Why is it centering the white body? Um, asking questions, being that person in the room who's going to bring up things that are like sometimes nerve wracking or like, you know, you, that are, can be inherently vulnerable because it means admitting that like we've all failed in a way, right? So like coming from that place of being like, hey, I understand we're all part of this like pretty messed up system, but like what's a small way that we can leverage um, this story or like this project to tell, to imagine a better future or to represent the actual now in a way that's more helpful. Um, and I think that just like, you know, if you, if you're, you know, if you're like, for me, like as the person that reads and moderates all of like the, a lot of the mail we get for Trailer Runner Magazine comments, like I read that stuff and I send the important ones to the people who, you know, sign my paycheck. So if you're someone who's like, I would love to see more diverse representation in media, like write to magazines, like comment on Instagram posts, like let the media know that you tell, you can tell that they're not making a good faith attempt to do a better job. Um, and that stuff, like when it comes from a good place, it can be very productive. Uh, don't do it in a way. Like, I think that something I think about also a lot being a millennial that works in the media space is call out culture versus call in culture. I don't think pointing fingers and saying like, 
hey, you did a bad job or like, hey, you're racist. Like that's not a great place to start a discussion saying like, hey, it seems like you might've inadvertently uh, supported a pernicious racial hierarchy in the way that you worded this or the way you represented this person. Can we please talk about this? I feel like we both have a lot to learn. Like trying to use things as a opportunity to call people into the fold and have conversations rather than saying like, you did bad and I know cause I am good is like not a productive place to come from. So try to use things that are maybe either upsetting or uncomfortable as that opportunity to call people in to challenging discussions. Um, find local organizations that are involved in anti-racism efforts, preferably led by people of color and help uplift their voices and their work. Um, you can support them with your actual capital. So like monetarily, you can support them with your social capital by promoting them on your social media channels if you're someone with that kind of social capital or just showing up. Um, manpower is also an incredibly powerful form of capital. Um, just some kind of more specific organizations that I was mentioning with Black Girls Run has a lot of chapters all over the US, which is something that engages uh, young African-American women in the sport of running, which is fantastic. It provides them with equipment, coaches, shoes, sports bras, all these things that can be challenging to access unless you have a certain level of financial security or you know, even parents who like, you know, know, are aware of the specific materials and things required to excel in those sports. Um, a lot, like I know something, <laughs> one of my athletes has talked with me a lot. She volunteers for the local cross country team, which is primarily Latino students. Um, she works a lot with them and she provides them shoes. She provides them coaching. Um, she's not on the call. She's currently hurt, but Erica, you are amazing. And I think you're doing amazing work. Um, so like it can be, you know, it can be very much in the realm of running this work. It can be very, it can not be in the realm of running, but there are ways to apply your certain skill set to help uh, with this cause. Um, another one I wanted to mention, I just started working on the board for Runners for Public Lands, which is an environmental justice nonprofit. Um, it is led by a person of color out of California. And we do a lot of work in the environmental justice realm. So uh, you know, it's not just about preserving, you know, parks for running or whatever. It's about making sure that every human being has access to clean air, water, um, and we tend to use public lands as kind of the springboard for that discussion to bring people into the conversation before uh, turning the conversation to a more like justice focused initiative rather than just like protecting lands for trail running. It's harnessing the power of trail runners and our shared interest in these spaces to engage people in more nuanced discussions around environmental justice. So if you guys are, I'm, we're currently trying to work to find people who might be interested in starting local cha chapters of Runners for Public Lands. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, definitely reach out. I would love to connect with you. We're working on uh, fleshing out our national committee and it's a very exciting time. And one of the reasons I really believe in this organization and I'm working with them is because of that environmental justice leaning, right? Um, as much as I love a good trail, like, you know, I didn't, I don't love trail running because of the trails. I love it because of the, the runners and I will do literally whatever it takes to protect all humans and runners. Um, and so just harness your spheres of influence, right? Like whether it's at work, at home, like, you know, conversations you have with your partner or your parents or your friends or like the person you run with, like those can be very potent conversations. I know um, personally, I love to, you know, hash out ideas that I'm struggling with when I'm engaging outdoors with my trusted friends and running partners in a safe, socially distant way. Um, and so, you know, just don't underestimate your influence, right? Like we've all, we're all a melange of our, of the in interests and ideas of others. Um, so just like understand that you have incredible power wherever you are exactly how you are today, right? Um, you know, even if the only other person you talk to is your partner or your mom, like when those conversations are honest and authentic, they can have immense power to change hearts and minds and just make other people curious because once again, I think it's very worth acknowledging the limitations of our understanding of this issue if it's not a part of your life. And so just kind of opening up others' minds to that same curiosity um, and then catalyzing that to tangible action, I think is, you know, that critical next step. Um, but just don't be afraid to get out of your lane, right? Like I know it's not uh, fun to be like, you know, good luck getting in a conversation with me without it getting political within like six to eight minutes. Um, but for a lot of people that might feel very uncomfortable, that might feel like a struggle, just know that that's okay. And leaning, like 
being uncomfortable um, can mean that good and challenging things are happening. Um, and that can be good for other people. Um, just once again, keep it polite, honest, and authentic, but you don't have to like paper over what you're feeling. You don't have to paper over uh, your experience ever. And you don't have to paper over um, the complexities of this real issue experienced by people in the world today. Um, so just don't be afraid of having challenging conversations and admitting you only know what you know and that your understanding is imperfect. And that doesn't make you a less good steward of this idea, right? Like you don't need to like, have memorized everything Ibram X. Kendi and Martin Luther King have written and like also recite every single like woke Instagram post you've seen in the past three weeks. Like admitting that you your knowledge is imperfect and your understanding is limited can be a really good place, um, a really nice vulnerable place to welcome other people into these same ideas. Um, and then, you know, I just think the, the last thing I'll say about this topic is just don't be overly reliant on social media because research shows that's like not a really great way to change people's hearts and minds. Having honest and authentic conversations personally with people that know and trust you rather than trying to demonstrate that. And I think this is like, it's, it's tough because like we are in a pandemic, so we're not all going to the office and like running with people. Um, we're being safe and that's really important. Um, and so it's, I understand this impulse to want to like use social media, which is like for a lot of us, the way that we're primarily engaging with the world and with people now. But I think that it just, it has its limitations. And so all, the best thing to do is just like have an honest check-in with yourself about what your intent here is and what you genuinely think the effect will be. Like when you're posting something, sharing something like, are you honestly trying to harness your social capital to have effective conversations with people that trust you? Excellent. Um, you know, otherwise, like if your heart's not in the right place or you have an imperfect understanding or you're just trying to demonstrate something rather than like genuinely embody it, um, you know, maybe hold off on that and try to have that conversation in real life with someone else instead. Um, so yeah, uh, eight minutes of anti-racism with Zoe. Uh, you know, I think that these, this, is, this was a question submitted by an athlete and um, I'm really glad they did. I know that, you know, a lot of times we spend these conversations talking about like the best ways to tie your shoes to avoid blisters. And those are great and perfect, but like, you know, I didn't, I wasn't born to just do that. Uh, I believe in all of our potential to have a genuine measurably positive effect in this world. Um, that is like one of the reasons that we are passionate about microcosm, right? We're not just here to like, you know, inspire people to jog and like, experiment with a weight training regimen like we are here to become better humans and athletes every single day and hold each other accountable for that and I view this this community as like a huge part of my growth experience and I hope that we can all um inform each other and grow together and I would love that you guys hold me accountable in that same way particularly understanding that like I have the platform of both microcosm coaching and trail runner, which has a huge and measurable impact in our community. And I just want to be particularly vulnerable and express that if you guys ever see me or microcosm or trail runner engaging in, or just like if you have feedback or like a uh, well-intentioned good faith critique, I am very much here for that. Um, I am an imperfect person. Um, I am learning, I am growing, I have come a long way on these issues, which makes me realize that I only have that much further to go. Um, and I would love that we can all go together on whatever these issues are. Um, and I'm not afraid to lean into these challenging conversations. This is like what I live for, right? Like I did not become editor at Trail Runner to like write more articles about training because like I could do that on my own time. I did it to change the world. <laughs> and that's like what microcosm coaching can be for as well. I mean, you guys are all part of that. Um, not just because of the effect that you guys have on other people. Like there are some really genuine rock stars on this team, like just amazing people, people who are already changing the world, people who have taught me uh, more about changing the world, people that have like taught me to believe in my own power and believe in my platform. And so like, I believe in you guys in that same way. Um, so let's move imperfectly towards a better future together. Um, and I hope this was not like a too weird start to your Friday morning, but I get really excited about this stuff because I genuinely believe that we can move the needle on it. And if it doesn't start here, then where does it start? You know, like if we aren't having these tough conversations with people we love and trust, people who are our teammates and friends and like co-coaches, then when are we going to have these productive discussions? So like, even if this, you know, like if you're already like so deep in anti-racism work, you're like, oh my God, I'm so bored. Like, thank you for letting me take up your time. Um, but I just, I think these discussions are important and they're uncomfortable and that that's really good. And um, I will never coach a team that shies away from these things. Uh, another 
total switch. Uh, now for something completely different, Kylie, if you're still there, yeah. uh, what real foods make good running foods on the go? Packables that pack a punch in a small space, not pre-bought gels, um, but something that you grab or make from stuff from the shops and could last the distance while not while being squished. Um, so I'm going to start this off with um, saying that everyone's gut is different. And so anything that I say, you know, you want to test it out because if you just go into an event or an adventure or something that it means a lot to you and you say, oh, she said on the call that I should just use you know, a cookie and you try these cookies that you haven't had before and then you have stomach issues, you know, that's not going to be a good thing. So just making sure that like whatever you're using or decide to use that you do practice with it. Um, and then also on that note, um, I did, I actually had a post on my Instagram the other day about terms that, um, people do not like hearing it that kind of resonate with them with diet culture. And someone mentioned that real food, the term real food um, is something that they didn't like being promoted in the endurance community. And so I actually thought about that a little bit and I was like, you know what, you're right. So I think there's this idea in the community that sports nutrition products are not real food, which is not true. So sports nutrition products do have a purpose. Gels have a purpose. Um, real, the food blends that we're eating, spring energy, those have a purpose. Um, so I'm trying to, I, you know, I'm guilty myself of making posts that like real food options for fueling. And so I'm trying to make that shift actually a little bit um, first, because I want to try to not be um, triggering for people that have um, disordered eating or eating disorders. And I think that is a common, a common thing or a common language that is used that maybe we didn't think about. Oh yeah, like food options that are cookies um, versus like a gel, it, it's kind of demonizing in a way. So I just wanted to point that out because I thought it was an interesting, um, interesting feedback that I got on that, on that post. I think um, yeah, this so, is something just to jump in. I often see people graft a uh, flawed hierarchy onto food. Like, oh my God, like it would be perfect if I could just eat organic raw dates for run. Like, you know, like this, like looking for, you know, like this, just like a, like a false hierarchy on like real foods being better. But like, if you have a weak stomach and are just a lame person, then you can eat gels like the rest of us heathens or whatever. And I think that we're just trying to speak to the dismantling of this uh, flawed food hierarchy. Yes. So not to go off on a tangent there, I just wanted to make that point because I thought it was interesting. Um, and I also think it's important to consider what distance of race that you're doing. So, um, we race or adventure if it's you know some kind of adventure that you're doing if it's something longer um then yeah using um a food option versus a uh, gel option uh, might be a good idea but if you're doing a shorter event i honestly would not recommend using food as your source of fuel using a sports nutrition product is going to be better for for quicker efforts for higher intensity efforts because they have simple sugars in them that your body's going to use right away longer efforts you can you still want to have something that has like simple carbohydrates in it but you might want to have something that's a little bit lower glycemic um, that might also have a little bit of uh, protein in it a little bit of fat in it um, so I just wanted to, we had talked about that on a call before as to like when you might want to use a gel um, versus a, an option like a cookie or pumpkin bread or something. Um, and then going into the actual, like, what would you use? Um, so guidelines that I generally recommend are trying to not do something that's super high in fat. So making sure that you're not necessarily doing like a high fat bean and cheese burrito, which I know some people can handle, but I'm not really, I'm not really a proponent of that. Um, something that's not really high in fiber as well is something, something to consider. So uh, during your 
long runs and long races, um, you really shouldn't be worrying about whether something has is whole grain um, or um, high fiber cereal or something. Um, you really want to be making sure that it doesn't have that much fiber in it. We want to be able to utilize that carbohydrate right away. Um, so lower fiber, I usually say if you're looking for a guideline between five and eight grams of fiber per hour um, is a good guideline. And then you would actually want to um, have a little bit of protein if possible. Um, after, I usually say around two, the two to three hour mark, the food choices that you're making, trying to get something that has a little bit of protein, um, eight to 10 grams an hour um, is what's recommended. Um, and then looking at the calorie content as well. So, if, you know, you have to consider what calories am I getting from my hydration mix? And then what calories am I going to need to get from my food option? Um, so when making the choices um, in regards to like portability, I think that is really going to depend on the person and what you um <laughs> what you're able to like, I know people that have put pizza in their, in their um, pack. So, you know, like cheeseless pizza or, but for me, that wouldn't really be realistic. So choosing something like a uh, PB and J does actually, yes, it's going to get squished, but um, it does tend to be pretty effective for people. Um, again, breads and um, like pumpkin breads and cookies are good options. Um, and then um, dates are another option. They are a little bit higher in fiber. So some people cannot tolerate those, but dates are a, a conveniently like carried option. Boiled potatoes is another, that's a common one is boiled potatoes with salt. Um, if you are wanting something that you wouldn't have to chew, um, you can actually get reusable flasks made by goo that you can, um, you could make like mashed potatoes with broth and you could eat those. I know it sounds weird, but a lot of ultra runners that I work with will use mashed potatoes with broth as one of their top choices because they're actually getting in um, more electrolytes as well. And that savory option is kind of nice when you're, um, you know, if, especially if you're using a mixture of gels or a hydration mix that's sweet and then you want something savory. Um, so that's something else. And then I do... Um, I have a recipe book on my website that has some food blends that are similar to spring energy, um, gels that you can make at home and you could put those in your reusable flask as well. So I nutritionally analyze those for, um, for sport. So if you wanted to get really creative and, and make your own, uh, real food blends, you can do that. <laughs> Um, see, I just said real food blends. I'm used to saying like real food and that's something that- That's a I'm better thinking. word. You should, we should think of a term and then patent it for microcosm. I know. I think just saying food versus sports nutrition products yeah. um, is, is what I want to go with, but it's hard because I'm so, I feel like I am trained now to say real food because it is something that we just say in the, in the endurance world. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I definitely feel the like, you know, like, oh, if you eat cliff shot blocks, then you're like, you're gross. Like you should just eat whatever berries you find along the way. Oh yeah. I mean, I get, I work with, um, with people that come to me and they'll say like, oh yeah, I can't use any of those sports nutrition products. They're evil. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> They're evil. <laughs> really? Oh, <boy. laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, so it just kind of depends on, uh, uh, how you're, you're viewing things, I guess. Um, but, but I would say that the sports nutrition companies are doing, uh, they formulate their products for the sport. So it's not, you know, I think there's this misconception that, um, utilizing a gel, um, is bad, uh, because it has sugar in it and sugar is bad. And so I think there's this connotation there that sugar is bad. So I can't eat those sports nutrition products but really our bodies want sugar, especially if we're running fast. So <laughs> run fast, eat sugar, microcosm. Yeah. Oh yes. Uncrustables. That's a good one. I love uncrustables. That's like my go-to. I, I tend to like, I have a, the 
the composition of my system is such that I do pretty well on like highly processed, like I love goo, like that stuff works really great for me. I feel zero shame or discomfort around it. But when I do things over like seven or so hours, I like to throw an uncrustable in there, which are 250 calories, which is like pretty, pretty great. Um, that's a, like a pretty nice sweet spot. They also have a Nutella version now, which is awesome and not vegan. Sorry, TJ. <laughs> yeah. Doing along the same lines, like doing a, I've had people do like wraps with, um, peanut butter and they'll like peanut butter and honey and they'll roll those up and carry it. Um, I've had a lot of different creative things that people have tried before. I would What's say. What's the weirdest thing you've had a client try while running? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I did have someone that wanted gummy bears. Like I would roll it up in a ball and eat it. What was that? What in back in the old olden times, I would take like gummy bears from like Lucky's in Boulder, and I would roll it up with Annie's like uh, chocolate bear cereal. Yeah, <laughs> I would make like a food wad, and I would carry like this disgusting gummy bear cereal food wad with me. And I remember wow. like the third time TJ and I ever hung out, I pulled out a food wad, like a sweaty gummy bear food <laughs> wad. He was like, you can't be serious. And I was like, no, 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 this is the good stuff. I also remember Zoe, when you carried around that five pound gummy bear for like a year. <laughs> so I still have it, by the way. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I promised my crew that if I finished Leadville, I would eat a five pound blue gummy bear that I got off Amazon and I didn't, finished Leadville and I still have this like mangy ass giant blue gummy bear in my closet and I'm gonna eat it someday and I'll probably die um, <laughs> it's just like I can't it's good to, like I love the blue gummy bears I don't know if you like Lucky's in Boulder has like a very special type of gummy bear and the blue ones are fantastic and I'd always get in trouble because I would like stand over the barrel and just like fish out the blue ones and they'd be like ma'am you can't just do that. Like, that's very gross and weird. You are an adult, please stop. So I ordered a five pound blue gummy bear from Amazon. Um, and I still have it because I believe in myself. That is awesome. <laughs> and like, every time I move, I like find it and it's like really losing its shape. <laughs> it looks like wilted, I guess. Like it's still, it's still holding together, but it survived like three moves at this point. <laughs> it's going to be like one of those things where it, like, uh, in Castaway, where Zoe ends up on this like deserted island, <laughs> she's gonna name her blue gummy bear, and it's gonna keep her going. Ma'am, you could have eaten that. No, he's my friend. Um, I did want to. Uh, that's a good segue into a common one that I get is people want to use candy when they're when they're running, and I think that using candy in small amounts is okay. I just wanted to note that using high amounts of candy can get you into trouble because oftentimes they're used, candy is using a lot of high fructose corn syrup. And so the um, fructose doesn't necessarily react in the gut very well for a lot of people, especially in excess. So just be careful with candy if you are using that as an option. How many, I've seen a lot of people on Instagram that are like die hard, Sour Patch Kids fans, and I've never, <laughs> so never jumped on that a, train. What would be a high fructose? Yeah, I just I feel like, just, like a stomach ache in a bag. Yeah, yeah, so I think in small amounts you would be okay because we do have a glucose and fructose um, channels on in the small intestine to kind of transport across into the body to utilize for that energy. Um, so in small amounts, that's fine. But if that's, if you're eating large amounts of Sour Patch Kids, or that's the only source of nutrition that you're using <laughs> that can get you into a lot of trouble. And I usually say, you know, even if you are training and you're using something like Sour Patch Kids, your gut can adapt a little bit, but you never really know um, what's going to happen on race day. And I think that's taking a chance if you're, if that's your only method of fueling. Um, yeah, so I was wondering about that because there's a, a race that I'm doing coming up and because of COVID restrictions, there, there were supposed to be aid stations where your crew could access and now it's just like a self-supported adventure. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, how many gummy bears should I pack? But probably not that many, huh? <laughs> well, you can, have, need again, you can have some, but I just want to- wads per hour. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
But I like the per pierogies one as well. I uh, did have someone that I worked with that was um, using those as part of their fueling plan and they work really, really well. So I forgot about that. So thanks for throwing that out there. Yeah. Yeah, I guess kind of jumping off that same question thematically um, for another food related question for Kylie is, IV hydration bars, would it help recovery or is it hipster nonsense? Um, so I think the deal with that, <laughs> um, I, I don't recommend necessarily using the, the IV hydration bars on a, on a regular basis. If you were in, can you describe what that is? I'm not sure I know what it even is. Oh, okay. So you go have to the in Carbondale even. They have one in Aspen, of mm. course. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can go and you can get infusions of like vitamin C, like large amounts of vitamin C, or you could go get an IV bag um, with electrolytes in it or something like that. Um, and you just walk in and they do have, they usually have like nurse, actual nurses working there um, and they give you this IV infusion. Um, and so normally what I say is, you know, why do you need a large amount of, of electrolytes or something like vitamin C at one time, especially something like, like vitamin C, because oftentimes um, it is water soluble. So you're going to end up peeing out a lot of that. Um, and so it's I, urine. what expensive urine, urine. Yeah. Now there is a different form of vitamin C, like the lipid uh, form of vitamin C that they might give it some of these bars that might be better absorbed um, or it's like lipid encapsulated. Um, but I, in general, these are the types of things that, um, that I think people are looking for maybe as a magic solution. So rather than um, doing, spending your money on something like that, focusing on everyday, like eating enough and getting in ba good balance and making sure you're getting in fruits and vegetables. And, you know, you have your own electrolytes at home. Like you can use table salt as well. You know, there's a lot cheaper options that you can get from your food at home. And so I think unless you're in an extreme situation that you, you know, and, and in that case, I don't even know if I'd recommend going to an IV hydration bar. You know, if you have a medical yeah, situation. Kind of like for most <laughs> yeah. people just, eat right, sleep well, do the good, like normal stuff. Uh, and if that doesn't feel sufficient, like consult an actual medical professional and like, don't just go to Aspen. Yeah. Yeah. There's also, I, I think there's like three or four of those bars in Boulder now. Like I'm sure. Yeah. Two on Pearl street. Uh, <laughs> one's called like honest Ivy. It's right next to box car. Um, I remember seeing it and just like, or you could drink water like raising an eyebrow eyes, literally, <laughs> literally yeah. well and i, I like, think it, this is what we should do we should just stand in front of these bars and like hand out kylie's business card this is our exactly. new business model well, i think the, the problem is is that again and i had this conversation with um with someone yesterday um that's kind of like an expert in the field and we were talking about how um some of these things might make a, a very small difference for people. So I'm not saying that it's not going to make a difference, but what runners and endurance athletes really need to be focusing on are the things that make the biggest difference, the foundational nutrition skills that while yes, it sounds very simplistic and um, you know, maybe very simple and you know, people don't necessarily like to hear about um, eating enough, you know, underfueling is something that is talked about a lot because it actually does make a huge difference in whether you're going to recover, whether you're going to get injured, um, whether your hormones are affected. So there's so many things that underfueling can affect. Um, and so, so working on these foundational skills, nu nutrition timing, nutrition timing is going to make a bigger difference than an IV hydration bar is, you know, so really focusing on these foundational skills first before turning to something that might make a smaller difference. Um, and that's so. something you see in like all corners of training, right? Like so many people um, will sign up and they're like, what, you know, how many minutes a day should I do um, like my foot exercise or like, you know, you know, focused on like, oh, should the stride be 18 seconds or is 22 too much? Like focused on these really small things. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just do strides consistently for like seven years. 
Like, yeah, you know, it's I also like, feel like it's the, it's the same thing as like people trying to drink like alkalized or like pH oh, yeah, balanced yeah. water. Well, as, actually, like, that's like an even deeper level of bullshit because like yeah. you have organs that do that for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Your I pH is off. Like, there is no bottle of water that can help you. You need a professional. Right. And I think like the, basically the point is just that there's no shortcut. There's no secret sauce, unless we're talking about Baja Blast, like there's unless, nothing yeah. <laughs> that will help overnight. Like there's no, there's no such thing as overnight success with, yeah. with training. It's like, yeah. it's so unsexy, no. but it's like the foundation of what we preach here is like, there's no hacks, there's no shortcuts, sleep a ton, eat a ton, run as much as feels good. Um, do that for like 10 years and then, yeah. then we'll talk and when you have the opportunity that. to drink baja blast never pass that up never pass it up <laughs> i do want to also there's one other thing that came to mind when you guys were chatting is that a lot of the iv iv hydration bars you know they'll, they'll have antioxidant infusions um so vitamin c is an antioxidant and so I think we need to also be very careful when, if we were to take large amounts of antioxidants, um, the research is definitely pointing in the direction of especially vitamin C and vitamin E in large amounts um, can actually tr uh, hinder training adaptations. Um, so you need to be careful with um, antioxidants that you're supplementing with. And also even things that are, um, pretty simple, like tart cherry juice and pomegranate juice, um, doing too much of those things might not actually be uh, beneficial to you. So small amounts, yes, but larger amounts uh, potentially could hinder training adaptations to occur. So that kind of goes along with the IV hydration and, and how we might not want to be doing those large doses of things like vitamin C. Yeah, that's interesting. Because like exercise produces uh, like I'm going to be so out of my depth here. Uh, but like some antioxidants, like a lot of things, some amount of antioxidants is good, but also like oxidants aren't necessarily the worst thing ever. Like that's just like a byproduct of exercise, correct? In some ways. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we want to have uh, small amounts of inflammation post-exercise in order for training at adaptations to occur. So if you're constantly taking an antioxidant supplement or drinking tart cherry juice or pomegranate juice every time after you go for a run, then that is not going to be a be to your benefit. Yeah. I feel like my rule of thumb is like, if someone might sell it to you on Instagram, it's probably nonsense. <laughs> like, <Attention. laughs> yeah. and that's why our Instagram is 100% sponsored by sleep hashtag sleep <laughs> just just sleep big sleep lobby um yeah and those those are our questions this week so that kind of runs the gamut uh i hope you learned at least one thing um and uh tolerating drink more baja blast yeah drink more <laughs> baja blast be anti-racist yes. um microcosm <laughs> awesome well Thanks everyone for tuning in. You guys are amazing. 